All right, to kick things off, here are my top five Humphreys of all time. Number one, Bogart. He's looking at you, kid. Number two, Dumpty. Yeah, actual given name, Humphrey Dumphrey. The bullies rolled with Humpty Dumpty. Number three, Yang. Yang gang! Yeah, I'm an official member of the Yang gang. What? And honestly, that's all the Humphreys I can think of. Not a lot of Humphreys out there. And we couldn't get Bogart on the channel for obvious reasons. About 70 years late on that one, rest in peace, homie. And Dumpty is still recovering. Get well soon, bro. But you get the pleasure of meeting Humphrey Yang today. He's a former financial advisor turned social media influencer. And you've seen his TikToks, his Instagrams, and his YouTubes educating people about personal finance. He's got over a million subscribers and of course, over a million dollars in net worth. And that's why he's on today's edition of Millionaires in Cars Getting Coffee. We're gonna break down his wealth, his investing habits, and what he really thinks of Gen Z. It's gonna be fun. But before we get to it, let's finish our game of naming famous Humphreys. If you can't think of one more before I'm done with a sentence, you gotta hit that like and subscribe. Sorry, you lost. I don't make the rules. Don't hate the player, hate the lack of Humphreys. That's really what's to blame here. That is terrible. That is truly, truly awful. And while you're at it, give some love to the share button and send this to a non-Humphrey in your life. That should be everyone except for Humphrey Yang. Don't send this to him. He knows, he knows it's out there. He's too, he's fine. Let's get to it. Humphrey, thanks so much for being <laughs> on this segment. First name, Humphrey. Yep. Last name, Camel. You've got a newsletter called Hump Days, right? I do. The Hump it's Days free newsletter. to subscribe. It comes out on Wednesdays and Fridays, <laughs> Wednesdays and Saturdays. Do you have a trademark on Hump Day newsletter? Because I feel like with the last name Camel, it should have gone to me. It definitely should have gone to you, but so should have the cigarettes, I suppose. You're right. I'm not part of that <laughs> empire. Yeah. So speaking of wealth, you've accumulated um, a wonderful nest egg and portfolio. Could you like break down your wealth as it stands today? I worked in, in the corporate world for a long time, and I also invested for a long time. And I used to be a financial advisor, so I just have all this knowledge of- Your brain just thinks in terms of wealth and investing. And all it's always has been, even ever since I was a kid, I was just always thinking about how can I make money? But as it stands right now, I'd say half my net worth or more is invested in just stocks, index funds, if you will. And then I have uh, quite a bit of cash right now. About 30% is sitting in cash because I was planning to buy a home this year in California and I needed that big down payment. <sighs> yeah, that's serious. But now I'm having second thoughts because rates are so high. I'm thinking maybe it's better to not be 30% in cash and maybe be 10% in cash and just kind of put it into the market and see what happens. I don't yeah. own any real estate. I don't really own anything else. I have like a little bit of crypto. How much is retirement versus a taxable brokerage account? Oh yeah, I I used to have a 401k and I still have my Roth IRA. And I would say of my total investments now, I think the retirement portion makes up 15% of okay. all my investments, yeah. When did you officially hit that millionaire status where your net worth hit that million dollar mark and what were the factors that caused you to hit that? It was probably around 31 or 32 years of age, so not that long ago, four years ago. Um, I had been investing since I was 24-ish, so seven years of compounding and also the market did really well. Yeah. And I kept continuing to invest, so I kept putting money into the market even no matter what, basically. Always 15 to 20% of my income that was saved would go into nice. the market. And I had a really great paying job from the years of 2014 to 2016. I was a monetization manager. What is that? A monetization manager at a video game company. So a tech company. Oh, wow. I did that job for two years and it was it was almost like a all day, every day type job. Wow. But I was living at home this entire time oh. until the age of 34. So that's like a life hack in and of itself. So no rent, no bills? I was very lucky in, the, in that my dad wanted me to stay at home and was okay with me staying at home. Obviously, I had to deal with kind of like the societal negative impacts of living at home in your 30s would be. Yeah. But I saved almost every dollar that I, that I earned. You know, I was living very frugally. So you built that habit early on. You're investing 15 to 20% of your income for seven years, no matter if what the market's more. doing. Yeah, exactly. And that helped you hit that threshold. And it was largely in investments in cash at that point. Stock investments market, in cash, cash, and then also my business started to start making more money. And yeah. so when you have- Your income grew as well. My income grew as well. So when you have good offense and you, you pair it with good defense, which means not spending too much, your wealth grows. Yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like savings rate was a huge factor. My People, savings rate has always been high, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So that's huge. Definitely the percentage, agree. the amount of your income going towards investments, that's really the key versus, hey, the market did 7% or 8%. 
Yes, and not buying a new car. Ooh. Yes, because I know that too. we both have videos about the wealth killer in, in America. That's one of two, like my biggest video I think is about how auto loans are the wealth killer. And yours is <laughs> one is of the my, biggest That's two. my biggest video too. I, me too, me too. And the thing is, is that I have not had a new car and or a car payment in over now seven years, eight wow. years. So once you paid off that car, you were like, I'm done with car I'm payments. I'm done with it, yeah. And I'm, doing, I'm gonna try to drive my car into the ground. <laughs> People are always arguing with me about what kind of cars millionaires drive. Cause I go, they don't drive yeah. the cars you think they drive. So as a real life millionaire, can you tell us what you're driving? I actually drive the car you think I might drive as a millionaire. I drive a, Lambo. a no, I drive a used. So when I bought it, it was already four years used. A used Mercedes yep. GLE. Oh, it's the SUV. Yeah, those are beautiful. And when I got it, it had 15,000 miles on it. Yep. And most of the depreciation was already chipped away. Thank you. Which is great. And it it was also sitting on the lot for 60 days. So they had to get rid of that car that day or else it was gonna get get moved somewhere else. So, you, and had so some, you had some leverage in the negotiation too. Yes. And yes. luxury cars, they tend to take a pretty steep hit because most people want that new luxury car. They're worried about maintenance and they I do. love that you had that mindset of, hey, I'll let someone else take the hit on depreciation, I'll take the discount. Because we know, based on stats, new cars depreciate on average about 60% in the first five years. Oh, 100%, yeah, for sure. No one even knows that it's used, Yeah. right? And it still looks brand new. I still get you know people compliments on it all the time. You paid cash for this. I paid cash for it. So I actually had payments for the first eight months. And then at the end of eight months, I was like, okay, I have the cash for this car. Why am I making payments, paying interest in this car? And I was just like, you know, if I just get rid of this co uh, cost right now completely, yeah, it would suck in terms of my bank balance, but my peace of mind will go up so much. And once I did that, I felt completely more free. And once I felt free, I felt like I had more options. I almost, it almost gave me more flexibility to take, take on more risk because I had this like, I didn't have any debt obligations, if that yeah. makes sense. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Well, you've talked about the trade-offs uh, needed sure. to invest and build wealth. What were some of those sacrifices for you? <laughs> Living at home, that was definitely one of them. Um, you know, I didn't really buy new clothes for a very long time as well. I would wear the same things. In fact, some of my shirts had holes in them and my, my friends would give me crap about it. So and your lifestyle stayed low. My good, lifestyle very has little been expenses. Yeah, my lifestyle has actually been the same since 2014 because I track it in an expense tracker. That Every is expense goes into this expense tracker on my phone and I put it into a spreadsheet. And what I've noticed is that my discretionary spend from 2014 to now, it's almost been 10 years, has been roughly the same. Obviously it's gone up with cost of living, et cetera, but um, like back, back in 2014, I might've spent $1,500 a month on discretionary expenses. Now it's closer to 2000, wow. which makes sense. But as my income has grown, I still think that's great, right? Yeah. And I and I track it every month and I make sure I don't go too much. So you are very intentional with every dollar coming in. Yeah. And that's like, what's helped you keep this wealth that you built too. Exactly. Like if I buy you coffee right now at Duncan, it's gonna go into Listen, my little spending It's my on little spending me, tracker. baby. This is millionaires and cars getting coffee, <laughs> and I'm taking you to a Boston Bostonian favorite. Can I get a coffee? May I have just an iced coffee, please? Um, I'll just do a Small black cold brew. Can I get a donut? And a donut. We'll get a donut. Let's. What, we're gonna live what today. What would you do for a donut? Kill a man. This is very. No one's ever done the donut trick. That's impressive. <laughs> I this thought I'd switch exciting. it up for you. I love millionaires this. and cars getting coffee and donuts. Now we know what do millionaires eat? Donuts. donuts. And by the way, guys, we're paying for this with a debit card. Wow. Uh, There's your donut. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Boom, I'm like Charlie D'Amelio. I was thinking that <laughs> just now. I was like, he's just like Charlie. Yeah. Hey, Humphrey. Listen, Humphrey's captive in here, and that, that's not good. But you know what else isn't good? Your data being captive. Because data brokers are out there selling your information, and it's not okay with me. And that's why I use Delete Me. They find and remove data about you from hundreds of sites, and they send you an easy to read report outlining what they did. And with my link, you'll get a one year plan for less than nine bucks a month to help keep your personal info off the web. So set your data free. Don't let it be captive. Go to joindeleteme.com slash George for 20% off, or just click the link in the description. All right, back to the ride. Cheers, Cheers. to building wealth and drinking caffeine. Dunkin' Donuts. Look, I got my donut. Oh man, this, yeah, point, show that to the oh, camera. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of stuff 
money can oh, buy. Oh, yeah. Has it, what's, what's like a splurge for you now? Because I feel like you still are fairly frugal, mm. but you've also, you know, you're making good money, you've built wealth, you've done it all the right way. Financial splurge. Yeah. Okay. I kind of, it's mostly just travel stuff now. So if I go somewhere, like for example, I'm in Nashville, I'm staying at a nicer hotel than I usually would stay at because I just want to be comfortable. Yeah. So, so like it's usually, I'm not staying in the Motel 6. Yeah, it's usually something more more travel-related, exper- experiential-related. Um, you know, if I buy something material, it doesn't really hit the same. I also splurge a lot on camera equipment and camera gear, but I feel like that's Love kind of a gear. business expense. You though. can justify that. I've heard you talk about the fire movement and that the retirement part uh, didn't appeal to you. You know, financially independent, retire early. What is your take currently on the whole fire movement? It depends on what you define as retirement, right? If retirement means to you that you can just live the rest of your life without ever having to do active income again, I like what the fire movement is about. Personally, I feel like I would get bored not working. Yeah. I've gone through stretches of not working and I'm just like, what am I doing? You You get a little stir crazy. You get a little stir crazy. So I always want to be working on something. And I feel like even when I'm 65 or 70 years old and I quote unquote retire or stop actively working, I think I still want to do something. Yeah. Yeah, You can't just sit for 20 years and watch Netflix. Yeah, exactly. Although there's a lot to catch up on, I feel like. There is a lot to catch up. It's it's exhausting. (laughs) It's overwhelming. Yeah. So yeah, I like that take. Is the, the idea of retiring early no one really thinks about what that next 30 years looks like. They just have the goal of quitting this job. If yeah, you're I mean, running from something instead of toward something. My dad quit his, or my dad retired twice and he just got bored. And, you know, I saw that firsthand. And I've had, I have many friends' dads who also quit or friends' moms who also quit. And they're just like, wow, I've got nothing to do. Or the spouse is like, you need to get out of the house. You're driving me yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's always good to have something that you're working on. Maybe it doesn't have to produce active income when you're retired, but. As long as you're like growing and building towards something, that's always something that I really enjoy. No, there's a lot of wisdom there. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about the the young whip, whippersnappers out there. What is your <laughs> advice for Gen Z, younger millennials? Like if you were just sitting down coaching them and they're frustrated with the current state of the world and the economy and their finances, what do you tell them? I always wanted everything now, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're all we're in a culture where everything is instant, instant gratification. gratification. And I realized through building businesses because I did an e-commerce business before YouTube. Stuff takes like three years before it even gets going, you know? And it's like, you need this long-term time horizon of like at minimum five, 10 years, in my opinion, to be really great at something. And so I I would just say, when you find something that you like, that you want to do, whether it's a nine to five job, you're working at a corporation or or it's something on your own, give it five years. Yeah. Give it 10 years and see where you, where it you come It seems like there at. is a lack of stick to of just that commitment to something because we're like, well, this isn't it. I got to jump. This isn't it. I got to jump over here. So there's just constant movement. Yeah, and admittedly, I used to, I mean, I did that too, right? Like I jumped around a lot in my 20s. So, you know, it's, I guess it's a little bit, you know, I am kind of <laughs> speaking from experience here, but it's like, I wish, I'd, I wish I kind of stayed a, a, at some certain places a little longer. Yeah. Instead no, of just giving sense. up so quickly. Well, that, that's... My story at Ramsey was, I've been here for 10 years. I think I have the longest running career held by a millennial. You know what I mean? I've had six jobs at Ramsey, but I decided just to commit and plant my roots at one place and go yeah. all in. And I think it's part of my you know, my career success, even going from intern to personality and all this stuff. And so I recommend to people, don't just jump around willy nilly for another buck. Like find out what you really want to sink your teeth into and commit to it for a long period. I will agree, unless that person is not making... If they're miserable if, and if underpaid. They're, if they're miserable and they're not continuing to get raises or, you know, role changes like you have, right? Yeah. Like, so if you're in the same job for four years, they haven't done anything to help progress you, you want to learn more and nothing's going on, maybe that's a good time yeah. to switch jobs. That's good advice. Yeah. Uh, you, you've talked a lot about psychology when it comes to money and marketing and consumerism. And I loved this, uh, this video you did talking about the TVs at the front of Costco. Yo, Costco, what's up with the TVs at the front of the store? They call me the Kirkland King, the Costco cowboy, if you will. <laughs> no one calls you that. <laughs> and I've always noticed that, but the way your video was presented, it was interesting, uh. Uh, the way you presented anchoring. Yes. So what's behind the psychology of that product at that spot at the front of the store yeah so humans have a tendency to be psychologically anchored as they call it or 
impressed easily by the first number that they see. And so Costco will put their TVs at the front because when you when you get in, you get kind of a price shock. You're like, oh my God, $2,000 for a TV, $1,000 for a TV, $800. For the 8K 75 inch Whatever it TV. is, right? And then, you know, so you go through the rest of the store and when your bill comes out and it's 200 bucks, you're like, oh man, I didn't spend that much today. Mm. But had you not even seen that TV, before the trip and you said, you're gonna spend 250 bucks at Costco, you might think that's a lot of money. We see this all the time. The best analogy I feel like is like popcorn at the movie theater. Sure. Like the small yeah. is six bucks, the medium is going to be eight bucks and the large is nine. You're like, well, I might as well go for the large. Exactly, exactly. I'll Decoy, get the most yeah. value. Decoy pricing, we see that all the time. Starbucks too. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure Tesla too, you know? They're no stranger Just, to that. They're no stranger to pricing strategy either. I love it. Uh, you, we talked about savings rate and the importance of that. And I know in America, our savings rate is abysmal. I just did a yep. video on like 401k by age. Yep. We're lucky to see like seven, 8% savings rate. We're lucky to see that, yeah. And uh, you posted a video about the savings rate of people in China, that was interesting. Yeah. 45.9%, whereas Americans are closer to three, to five, 3.5 like, to 5%. Yes, it's, de it's definitely one of the biggest cultural shocks that I've personally seen in my life is that my Chinese parents, they love saving money. My dad gets more of a thrill out of saving a dollar than earning a dollar. Is that uh, the cultural thing? Like, is America the land of abundance? And so we're like, eh, we'll worry about savings later. Like, why America, do Americans suck so bad at saving? I think the America, America is the land of debt. Mm. I've said you, in the book, America's land of the free, home of the broke. Yeah. Like, we have one of the greatest countries with so much wealth and opportunity that we are just, we've lost our minds on the cons consumer spending side. And that yes. is a huge part of that. Exactly. And so it's I well think marketed in America. America is the We're home of one. consumerism. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, maybe you, you know, we want to be somewhere between America and China, right? 45% is a, a very high savings rate, and many of them hold it in cash. And so well, I'm guessing, like in China, mm -hmm. is there less debt? Because you can't invest 45% when you have payments coming out your eyeballs. Correct. There is less debt. I mean, most people in China, they like to buy things in cash. That's smart. Yeah. Now, this is something everyone wants to know. Sure. As a, as a guy who's successful, you know a lot about investing. How are you investing your money in 2024? Ah, uh, 2024 is just a lot of index funds, man. <laughs> S&P 500. So you're not yeah. getting fancy, because a lot of people go, well, did you see, well, should I go all in on Tesla or Apple? And what about the div these dividend funds? I had an idea like that once. A long time ago. But you're saying, hey, I'm just going to invest in the total stock market. The total stock market is generally the way to go. I have had many individual stocks in my past, and that those positions have grown because I own a lot of Apple. And Which so, is already in yeah, your index funds. And, and, and I've owned Apple since 2014, so you can tell my Apple position has just gone really big. And I should diversify, but I don't want to take that capital gains hit right now. Mm. How is your view of wealth change since you started your channel and creating content? I feel like back in the day, I thought to be wealthy, you just had to make a lot of money. But these days I know it's more about how much can you save as well. So, you know, in 2023, I tracked all my expenses. I spent a little bit too much money than normal. And as well as business expenses, I think I went a little bit too ham on, uh, on lighting and equipment. Yep. So this year I'm trying to rein back all the spending and just, just keep increasing my income. So I would say it's savings rates. It's not what rates, you earn, it's what you keep. That kind of mentality. Keep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously you gotta earn a lot too, or try to increase your earnings by doing side hustles and having you know different types of things going on. But savings, what you keep is more yeah. important, right? Well, so. as we take calls on the Ramsey Show, I'm finding more and more people are just out earning their stupidity. Like they're making 190K <laughs> and they're surviving, they can manage the payments, but they are like broke. You know what I mean? It's yeah. crazy because yeah. their lifestyle creep just eats away Man, all their I income. Know. They bought too much house, they're doing too many things at once, they're messing around with debt. So you're right, I think it's what it's what you keep. And uh, I've just found a debt-free lifestyle just gives you so many more options and, and much more peace. You know, that is the one thing I do agree with the Ramsey uh, solutions. The one the, thing. Well, I agree with a lot of things. This will be a great title. The one thing Humphrey agrees with Ramsey I agree, on. I agree with a lot of things, but I do think a debt-free lifestyle is the number one thing that yeah. I agree with. How much debt do you have currently? Oh, zero. Right there, y'all. Yeah. Humphrey has zero debt. So if you're thinking, well, the wealthy all use debt, apparently not, because he's wealthy. I do have credit cards, though. You were this close, and you blew it. But you pay them off every month. 
Let me I, guess. I pay them off every three days. Every three days. Every time I spend money, I just try, I log into my credit card account. I'm like, pay it off. Wow. So I always treat it like cash, and I think that's the one reason why I don't mind having a credit card. But I also acknowledge that many people that get credit yeah. cards don't do that. You're also a super nerd with an I'm expense super, tracker that yeah. gets fed into a spreadsheet. <laughs> so you know, like everyone thinks that they're going to be Humphrey but they don't live the Humphrey way. And so that's my rub with the credit card, you know. I argument. understand. Uh, but I yep. did get our friend Seth Godwin to cut his up on a TikTok live. I did see that. This has been really fun, Humphrey. I, yeah, I, thanks, George. This is our first time like really getting to hang out. So it's fun getting to know you and getting to hear your thoughts on building wealth. And you've been helping a lot of people. I've been following you on the internet for ever now and you've been crushing it since day one and it's fun to get to meet you here in nashville cool great to be on the show and make sure to subscribe to george guys that's right smash that subscribe <laughs> button let's make graham stefan jealous how's that uh yeah sorry graham sorry yeah i got it let me let me re-edit that part cheers man all right cheers i mean talk about a rousing conversation Huge shout out to my new most favorite Humphrey for joining me today. What a wonderful person he is. Now make sure to let me know in the comments section who else you want to see on this series. And don't forget to share it with a friend who could use a, a personal finance mentor in their life. They'll thank you later. And if you like today's video, there is more where that came from. Check out the first official summit of the financial YouTube Avengers, Humphrey Yang, Jaspreet Singh, and myself, as we get dangerously real about life and money. How dangerous, you ask? Well, you'll have to click to find out or click in the description below. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.